Hi everybody, I'm Mike Nelson. I want to talk to you a little bit about climate change. When people come up to me and say, Mike, do you believe in climate change? I would say you can believe in the tooth fairy or the Easter bunny, but it's not a question of believing in climate change. It's a matter of understanding climate change. If you'd like to understand more, I have a new book that's available called The World's Littlest Book on Climate, 10 Facts in 10 Minutes about Carbon Dioxide, and I can get you a free download. Just send me an email at mike.nelson at the denverchannel.com. So television meteorologists are as close to a scientist as most Americans get, and we can help educate our viewers. You're not going to run into some of the brilliant climate scientists up in Boulder and be able to say, hey, tell me about climate change, most likely. But I'm invited into your home often, and for that reason, I have a special opportunity and I think a special responsibility to talk about this. So here's a cartoon. This guy's out in the snow. He says, what am I doing? I'm shoveling 36 inches of global warming. There's an important difference between weather and climate. So Climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Climate is a long-term average. Weather is chaotic and changes rapidly. You'd expect Miami to be warmer than Denver in February because that's the climate of Miami. But you might go to Miami and get a bad week of weather and have it be cold and rainy there while it was nice and warm and dry here in Colorado. That doesn't mean the climate change. It means you get picked out bad week. For that reason, it's actually easier to predict climate than weather. and it's basic thermodynamics. If you add heat to something, it gets warmer. It's why day is warmer than night and why summer is warmer than winter. I like to say that uh, weather is like one play in a football game where climate is the entire history of the National Football League. If it's snowing in Las Vegas, well, it's wintertime. And we expect as the climate system gets more energy, we're going to have more wild weather variations. And Global warming creates a steroid effect, making storms bigger and stronger, making droughts warmer and drier. So what do we know for sure? People say to me, Mike, climate's always changed. Why do you think it's changing because of us now? Well, we've had ice ages, we've had continental drift, we've had mass extinctions. We know why climate changes. And there's really only three things that affect it. The solar output, which we can measure, and it's not changing much right now, the changes in the orbit, look up Milankovic cycles, and you can read a whole lot more. The orbit around the sun changes on a period of about 100,000 years. The axis will tilt differently on a period of about 41,000 years, and it spins around like a top, kind of doing this, on a period of about 23,000 years. Those things are what tip us back and forth in and out of ice ages, except now we're rapidly changing the chemistry of the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Matter of fact, the average global carbon dioxide now is at 417 parts per million, easily the highest in the glacial period, but actually the highest we've seen in over three million years across the planet, and that's all due to the burning of fossil fuels. Now, how do we know that? because we can look at the flavor, if you will, of the carbon dioxide, the isotope, and it's from the burning of plant material that's been buried underground for millions of years. The rate of increase, unfortunately, is growing, not shrinking, and the residence time, how long it stays in the atmosphere, is centuries, so it's a big problem. How do we know for sure? Well, we can reconstruct the past. We can measure ice cores, tree rings, corals, sediment, Ice traps ancient air, so when we dig up a big ice core from Antarctica, we can actually analyze what the air was like in that centuries ago and see what's happening now. The tree ring patterns show periods of drought. Coral indicates ocean temperatures. Sediment cores can also indicate ancient ocean chemistry. Folks will say to me, Mike, oh, this is just recent stuff we've been worried about. No, we've known this since the 19th century. In 1825, Joseph Fourier, a French mathematician realized that the Earth is too far away from the sun to be as warm as it is. Well, the atmosphere, he theorized, was what was trapping heat. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln was president, and John Tyndall, an Irish chemist, recognized carbon dioxide being the gas that absorbs long wave or Earth energy. And Svante Arrhenius, in 1895, estimated that a doubling of atmospheric carbon dioxide would warm the Earth by several degrees. And let's not forget Eunice Foote, a woman scientist in 1856 that took glass jars and filled them with different gases, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, measured the, put them out in the sun and measured the temperature change. And Eunice found that it was the jar filled with carbon dioxide that warmed up the most. 
We also know the science is not political. Red, white, independent, whatever. The greenhouse effect is real. Without it, the Earth would be about 60 degrees colder and would be a lifeless ice planet. So that's a good thing. But it's too much of a good thing. Each doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases the energy retention, like a blanket around the planet, by 3.7 watts per square meter over the entire surface of the Earth. Now that's about like a child's nightlight or an old-fashioned Christmas tree bulb, but taking over the entire surface of the Earth, it's a huge amount of energy. And we know the ice is melting, the sea levels are rising. The forcing of that doubling of CO2 is about five degrees Fahrenheit over the entire Earth by the end of this century. The melting of the ice caps and glaciers caused a rise in sea level of five to 10 feet during that time. A billion people live within five feet of sea level. If you think there's refugee problems now, wait until those sea levels rise like that. And we know it's getting hotter. The hottest years on record have all been since the year 2000. Global temperatures continue to rise with record highs far outdoing record lows. Western snowpack continues to decrease. Summers are getting hotter, winters are getting milder. Snowpack is melting earlier. Our western water supplies are going to become more and more stressed. And it means that we're going to have more extremes. Fires, floods, droughts. This was all 2012, 2013, 2014. We're seeing that same cycle going on again. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I told you the residence time of that CO2 in the atmosphere is centuries. So there's not much we can do right in the short term to get it back out of the atmosphere. But there's things we can do to plan. We can mitigate the impacts, increase our water storage, promote better conservation of water, better construction techniques of roads that are in flood prone areas. Think of the road that heads up toward Estes Park all the way uh, through the canyons there that have flooded out. Uh, modernize fire and forest policies, improve public warnings, zoning, and change that in threat areas. New agricultural techniques and smart and effective uh, regulations are all very important. People will say to me, what about India and China? Well, they are working toward it because the citizens there can't breathe the air. And so they're rapidly deploying wind and solar, which was a little bit faster, but they are doing it. And in the third world, right now the third world spends $38 billion a year on kerosene lamps. It causes asthma, causes lots of breathing problems. So kids that are in uh, third world villages are trying to read using a kerosene lamp. You bring in just a little bit of solar power, you change everybody's life there with LED and solar power, maybe some refrigeration, they can keep medicines. So the third world will benefit much more from renewable energy. And we get high paying jobs, many more jobs in renewable energy than there are in coal and you can't import wind turbines, they're too big so they're built domestically. A lot of them here in Colorado. So look at this. This is L.A. in 1968. This is L.A. after the Clean Air Act. These wind turbines and solar panels. Computers back when I was young filled a room. Now I carry one in my phone. And this was, this was the uh, memory storage in 1956. IBM had uh, five megabytes for $120,000. Now we carry a little tiny chip that holds gigabytes of information. But energy then, energy now hasn't changed, but it's going to change. And change can sometimes happen fast. This is New York City Easter Sunday in 1900 on Fifth Avenue. There's one uh, motorized vehicle amongst all those horse and buggies. Just 13 years later, this is Easter Sunday, there's one horse and buggy, everything else is cars. We're seeing that change happening now with what we're seeing with the electrification of everything. So a few quotes before we finish up. This is from Einstein, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. Gaylord Nelson, the father of Earth Day, not a relation, but he also is from Wisconsin. When it is asked how much it will cost to protect the environment, one more question should be asked, what will it cost our civilization if we do not? And then finally, John F. Kennedy, today our concern must be with the future, for the world is changing, the old era is ending, the old ways will not do. A little hard to see this, but it's a climate summit. You get energy independence, preserve the rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, renewables, healthy children. And the guy says, what if it's a big hoax and we just create a better world for nothing? One more quote from Kennedy in 1960. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier, a frontier of unknown opportunities and perils. It would be easier to shrink back from that new frontier, but the times demand new invention, innovation, imagination, and decision. 
Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. We went to the moon in less than a decade. We can solve this problem. And we've done it before. Great and expensive projects have been completed in our past and they can again in the future. The Transcontinental Railroad, water treatment and plumbing, rural electrification, the Manhattan Project, the interstate highways, NASA and Apollo, fiber optics, the internet and high speed computing. Every one of these was expensive. Everyone is a big undertaking. Everyone has made our lives much better. We're doing it now. Renewable energy and battery technology are quickly growing and changing. Think of the car ads. They're all for electric vehicles now. Wind power is expanding fast. Battery powered buses and trucks on the 16th Street Mall. We're safeguarding our electric grid. If we were to build a direct current transmission system, it would be something that would use where it's windy and where it's sunny using like the interstate highways of electrons. It would protect us from solar flares. It would protect us from a nuclear electromagnetic pulse and it would quickly and efficiently move energy around. This should be a project that we do. And maybe we'll solve fusion. We take a lot of technology for granted that didn't exist 30 years ago, our cell phones, for example. Maybe we will finally tackle fusion. I'm optimistic because when I talk to schools, these young people become inventors. This is out at Lockheed Martin. They were building a weather satellite. I was out there doing an interview, and when I finished, they said, can we take a selfie? And I said, yeah, sure, why? And all these guys in their white coats said, you totally came to our school when we were little. And I thought, and now they're building rockets. This is pretty cool. These are my grandchildren. I'm going to finish with this. When Yuri Gagarin, the first human being to go into space, first got up above our atmosphere and looked out of his tiny porthole in his Russian-built spacecraft, he was terrified. Not that there was something wrong with the spacecraft. He was terrified because he had been taught as a child that he lived at the bottom of a great ocean of air. And as he looked out at the thin veil of atmosphere around, our, our, uh, separating us from the cold blackness of space, it terrified him how fragile it looked. As far as we know, this is the only place that harbors life. I think we'll find other places, but they're far away. It seems that it would be prudent that we take the best care of it we can for our future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not just about the polar bears, it's about our children and our grandchildren. Again, happy to answer any questions. Mike.Nelson at the Denver Channel.com. I really appreciate your time.